Are you there? Are you, are you seeing my screen? I'm just a second here. I'm, I've just got to go to meeting. I'm sorry. I should have gone earlier. I'm sorry. Earlier. <laughs> so, yeah. I don't do Slow down. Yeah. <laughs> Wait. Yeah. T t tell us. Methodology, right? And you'll have a um, uh, unfulfilled ship, uh, unfulfilled orders, um, not on hold. Let's say, for example, that's all the supply orders that the warehouse needs to be working on. Well, in this particular case, it looks like I'm looking at equipment orders, but just a... and um, so the orders are sitting there open. Now, eAutomate stores the tracking information in what they call the shipment. And that's the shipment record here. The, uh, and the reason why they do that is that a sales order could have multiple shipments on it, right? You could ship some stuff today, some more stuff in two days, you know, yada, yada, yada. So one, one sales order could have a whole bunch of different shipments that happen at different times. So that's why eAutomate has this step, you know, that ship step. So when you're looking at sales orders, you, know, you can right-click and say ship sales. That's what actually creates this shipment record here. And that's where the details, okay, today you shipped these items, and uh, that's all you shipped in that sales order. Tomorrow you may ship more. Okay. So the, um, the process that has to change or needs to be followed to make all this work correctly, especially if you want us to push the freight charges that get added to the invoice, is you have to ship it but not fulfill it. I know a lot of dealers, and we used to, we used to just highlight the order and say fulfill, which would create the shipment and create the invoice all in one step. Um, and uh, the problem with doing that for the integration is that as soon as I click this button and say fulfill, the invoice is created, and then you would go to WorldShip to go fill it all out, but when WorldShip goes to push it back, it can't touch something that's already been invoiced. There's just too many accounting issues that would be happen. So we don't, we don't update the invoice. We have, to, we have to pop this shipment before the invoice happens. Because what happens with the automate, is the automate, um, what it does, it goes to look at the shipment and says, what is the freight charge that you have on this shipment? Add that to the invoice. And it only looks at it at the time the invoice is created. So the cycle would be that you just, your, um, whoever clicks the right clicks and says ship the sales order here, that creates the shipment record. And when they click that ship sales, it gives them the option to print the pick ticket. So that, that process all still works the same. Creates the shipment in world ship. They just type in the sales order number. And when, I don't know if you put SO in front of your numbers or not. Um, but typically, if you do, I strip off the SO so that the warehouse guys in WorldShip, they would just type in 113109. They don't have to type in SO. That's too much. You know, anytime you have to mix numbers and letters, it's a pain in the butt. So they type in 113109. Oh, uh, it populates the WorldShip address, phone number, all the information in WorldShip from the Automate Live. It, it pulls it as soon as they hit the enter key. It goes out there and finds it. And it identifies it, and it, it locates the shipment, pulls the information to WorldShip. They weigh the package in WorldShip. And when they hit the, the button, it says process shipment in WorldShip, and that, that prints out the label. It prints the label in WorldShip, and then it pushes it back in the Automate, takes that information, and it updates this record. And it puts the tracking information in here. It'll add the freight charge in here, and then it puts your freight cost. And at that point, the integration's done. Everything else is still in the automate. So what the best practice is then you turn on eAgent to where it auto it, to, to tell eAgent to automatically take all my fulfilled supply orders and create, create an invoice for me after hours. And so then so by doing that, that fully automates pretty much the process so that the order entry team, once they enter the order, they're out of the picture. Everything's handled by the warehouse and world ship at that point in eAgent. It's, it's called, what is it, create invoices or auto create invoice. It's one of the auto create invoices tasks. Um, well, shoot, let me, um, uh, let me find it here and I'll show you. Let me see where I've got it here. While you're looking, I have another question. Sure. What happens if we create, and in our business, we drive out to our customers as well and make physical deliveries. Uh -huh. So let's say we process a shipment, UPS, and then one of my guys says, hey, I'm going to that customer. Can you mm -hmm. reverse it out easily or no? Um, 
you can't here if you've already shipped and it's already been invoiced, you can't. But let's okay. say that the uh, if the it depends on when they catch it. Do you, would your guys catch it after you ship it in World Ship? I mean, possibly. Like after we've already created a label. How often? Yeah, after you've already created the label in World Ship. I mean, not very often, but it does happen. Sometimes. Yeah, it, then you, then you'd have to go through the automate. You'd have to actually void the shipment. Uh, okay. It depends, and, and it, it's kind of weird. It depends on the on the status. You would definitely want to come into e automate. Um, I would I would come into e automate, and if it hasn't been invoiced yet, because that's the key. But that's why we typically set e agent to go after hours, like after five o'clock, because at that point, you know, um, anything that's going to happen for the day has pretty much happened. Um, you know, UPS has already picked up the orders. In other words, so there's there's nobody taking it back. So right. let's say it's uh, the order comes in at nine o'clock. Um, the guys in the warehouse go ahead and pack it and print the label, and everything's cool, and it's already updated all the stuff in here. And then the tech says, "Look, I got to go out there right after lunch. Let me just take it to them." Okay. Well, then what the warehouse guys would do would just come in here and they would void the shipment. Okay. And then when they void the shipment, that takes that that removes the charge and everything. It puts the sales order as unfulfilled, and then they would change the. Um, uh, I would I would change the um, um, uh, ship method here, right, right here. Right. Change Delivery. it to de deliver by tech, right? Whatever, and then just process it like process it like you would normally. And at that point, at that point, you you could even have it. You could tell the warehouse to just fulfill it and create the invoice now, or you still let the agent do it. Okay. Uh, let me see if I can remember what the. Um, Okay. Are you planning to have UPS send an email to the customer? Oh, I wanted to be able to do that. <laughs> I saw that with that information that you see, Gary, but it does send the customer the tracking number and lets them know that we ship it, and I think that's a great customer service tool. I'd love to start doing that. Yeah, so UPS, you know, we do that feature in, in our program where we can t tell the customer that the Ours is a little more sophisticated. You know, we can say what's back ordered, et cetera, and we can tell stuff that was drop shipped or, or sent to the tech or whatever. But, but just even with the basic UPS service, you, all you have to do is, is is have that email address in there, and you can you can have it send an email. So that's via WorldShip. That email is sent through WorldShip. Yeah, through WorldShip. There's a feature in WorldShip where where and Mike, do you remember, do you, you pull over the contact information so they can do that, right? Did we lose you, Mike? You're talking to me? You're talking Mike Kirkpatrick? Oh, so, Just, Mike. yeah, right. well, Mac, Mac. Well, I'll call him Mac. All right. <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. I had to find the password there, uh, for e-agent. It's like, okay, now I've... Now I've I'm sleep here. Let's see. You know, let's find it here. Hey, Mac. I was asking if they're going to use WorldShip to uh, email the tracking information. Mm -hmm. You push the contact over, right? So they can do. Yeah. That. So yeah. With, and they have so to do that. Uh, so this is and this is yeah. Let's just go here. So this is the e agent. It's called Auto Invoice Sales Orders. Uh huh. Right. And so I tell it to only auto invoice fulfilled items only, and then the advanced filter. I go in here. And I have it set to only do supply orders, you know, where the status is not the same as fulfilled, and you know, and yada yada yada, and the total amount's got to be less than this, and so forth okay. and so on. So you know, so you can, I can. And I was like, we don't have ours auto invoice billable because they want the uh, the uh, admin department still wants to look over all billable supply orders, and we don't do that many billable orders anyway, so it's not a big deal for us. But that's just a comfort comfort zone for them. Um, uh, so, but the um, there's no reason why they couldn't. I don't know why they don't. Because if this, if there's an issue, there's an issue. You avoid the invoice, and the automate is pretty easy at, at that. <laughs> it does that very well. So, um, so then that's the, and then we have one auto invoice sales orders that goes to the print queue, and that's the ones we send to the document queue, so that the invoice is automatically emailed out to the customers. I don't know if you guys are using the email feature or not. Right now we're just printing. Okay. Um, so that's um. So that's all it is. It's just creating that thing right there. It's to do not invoice if warnings exist. Um, you know, fulfill shipped only, which means only fill, only uh, create the invoice if the if the status is sh you know shipped. Uh huh. 
yeah, right there. So it won't, it won't grab these, it only grabs the ones that are status ship. So to make it work for the, um, um, to push the, mail, uh, the email address, you need to use an ordered by. Because that's the only okay. place we're going to get the email address. So what we do there is that you would just have your people, they would create a new ordered by if the person's name didn't exist. And you uh -huh. would think you'd think that your team would would would, would buck about that and go, nah, it takes too much time. But then you explain no, to them. Y'all could y'all do it already? Yep. And you okay, just well, set the email as their preferred method of contact? Right, exactly. So then okay. I what I do is I'll create the I create the view to pull the email address off of the person from the ordered by. And uh, and then I push that into WorldShip. And then in WorldShip, you know, you that then you just set up WorldShip to do the email notifications. That really has nothing to do with my integration. No, that's 100% WorldShip. Cool. That's you know that's settings that you make inside of UPS that just says uh, I can't even remember where they are, but there's some, some configuration settings that uh, that uh, the UPS uh, support guys can tell you. But it's it's pretty obvious. I think I went into the configuration. There was a little checkbox that says send uh, send tracking notifications um, to recipient, something like that. So all, all, all I have to do is make sure that it pushes the email address over. And, uh, and then that's pretty much all there is to it. I mean, it handles multiple uh, packages. It handle, handles whatever. So the question is that when you want to charge freight, how much freight do you want to charge then? I've, ha I've had people say, always charge $15 or take, the, take my UPS calls times 1.2, you know. Mm -hmm. so I think did, we're wanting to mark up on ours, so like UPS cost plus 2%. Yeah, that's what we do. So you just just make note of those things. So because I, I go to install it, that's just things I install in the script, and then it's pretty much turned on. Um, uh, and then it'll go. And uh, so we'll just take whatever you and it, it handles. Like I said, with multiple packages, it all goes. So what happens is that uh, when the uh, warehouse types in the order number, they they punch it, and they ship it, and everything goes great. It's like awesome. It was you know it updates the automate. Or did I delete the shipment? And um, and uh, go to fulfilled again. So let's say that they make a mistake. Not that they ever do, but let's just, you know, in a non-perfect world. Um, once it's shipped here, what I do is to help prevent them from doing double shipments. Is that if I if I see the shipment already has a pet track a tracking number, then I don't I don't make it visible to WorldShip. When they, so if they type in this order number again, if there's a packing number here, it's, it's going to just beep and say, I can't find that sales order. And so what they would have to do, if they had made a mistake in the shipment and they wanted to, re, let's say they left their lunch on the, on the scales and didn't realize it. Um, so they have to void the shipment in, in the WorldShip, which is easy. But to make it show back up, they have to come into the shipment here and remove the tracking numbers. Okay. And so they just remove these, tra click on the remove button here, and then they click OK. And then when all those tracking numbers are gone, then they can type in the sales order number in um, WorldShip and it will show back up again. So that's just one of, I felt like that was the, it was better to give them a little bit of pain for the, for the rare instances when the printer jammed and printed a bad label or they screwed up something than it would be to just let them type in the number and create the shipments over and over again. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Um, and then the um, uh, the only other thing is that there's a bug in, in the automate that if you had shipped five packages on that one sales order, you know, like it was you know four boxes, it was too big to fit in one. All the numbers come in here, and that's awesome. But when you come in here and click on the remove, you could you can click remove on four and click OK, but it only removes one at a time. One at a time. You have to keep going back. Yeah, you have to keep kind of going back in there and, and highlighting the next one and say remove OK. And then go back in again and kind of like the next one and say remove OK. It's kind of an odd, obtuse bug, and I don't think you, I, I think they've got it fixed in version eight. But so few people were using this tracking information stuff out of a thousand clients that nobody's ever really, you know, lit a fire on the DGI's butt about it. But uh, yeah. I, I, we've been we've been poking about it. And I think they've got it fixed in version eight. So that's really it. So the whole concept would be that once we get the, and it takes about anywhere from an hour and a half to two hours at first to do the install, we like to do a go-to meeting to your WorldShip machine with you. And then from that WorldShip machine, we typically have your IT guy person will open up a SQL Server session so that we can install the scripts. There's about uh, five scripts 
in a custom table we install. And what that means is that we don't touch anything that's eAutomate. Um, like we don't customize any of their scripts, we don't customize any of their tables. So it makes it uh, so that when you do upgrades and things like that, it doesn't affect the integration at all. Uh, so the way ours works is that when you process that shipment in WorldShip and it exports it back, it actually goes into a custom table I create inside of the eAutomate that just holds the UPS information and eAutomate itself doesn't know anything about it. And then that table has a little, uh, what they call a trigger that says anytime something comes in, then go do these ex next two steps. And those next two steps is where I go update the shipment, right? That was what you see there, that shipment. So it's pretty uh, um, innocuous. Uh, it's, uh, e automates blind to it, and it's blind to e automate. We, have, we did have found other bug, another bug in eAutomate, in the eAgent auto task, auto invoice task, uh, if you tax freight, uh, if you have to charge tax on your freight, then we have to get Digital Gateway to get with you to give you a, um, a new e-agent for the auto invoicing piece. And okay, we don't do that. Yeah, if you don't, that's good. And it's one of those weird things is, gosh, it took a year for us to... Um, to figure that out with Digital Gateway to kind of convince them. It has nothing to do with UPS. It has nothing to do with this. Trust me. And uh, anyway, long story short, they, we got it all worked out, but it's, I just have to always say, okay, if, you're, if you have to tax freight, then I have to get you hooked up with Brigetta at Digital Gateway so she can give you the, the, the bug, the fixed um, e-agent. But if you don't, then that's awesome. That makes the world easier. Okay. And you said like from beginning to end about how long does it take to be all set up and ready to go? about an hour and a half to two hours. We log in and we do the mapping on the world ship machine for you on one, uh, do you, just, you just have one world ship machine? Yes. Yeah. We do the mapping, so we do the import map, the export map. Uh, typically we just need your IT guy there because that's like three steps that he needs to give, he needs to type in the password for your SQL user. Um, so he types that in three times and then it memorizes it there. He has to give us access to that SQL service so we can uh, install the scripts for him. And then we, um, and then I test it. Then we actually have you create a supply order, and um, we um, uh, we use that one order, and we'll just go into WorldShip and ship it, and then check to see if it updated here. Then we'll avoid this one, go back into WorldShip and test it, and see if it. What if we did uh, five packages? Yeah, that that worked, and then we avoid it, and then we. So we just take that one sales order and run it through every scenario. Then we'll go to the custom property and change the customer to one of the to do not build freight, and then we'll try to ship it in world ship and see if it that makes sure it doesn't have the freight charges. So we just need that one little dummy sales order. Uh, and obviously if you're going to have the $400 rule, then we'll want to have it maybe for two items, one for uh, one for $399 and one for $5. So we can um, easily go back and change the amount and see if it does make sure it doesn't bill it if, it go, if we add the $5 item. But yeah. And then we just void, void everything. So. So we just need one dummy sales order that we can play with to test all the scenarios to make sure it works the way it's supposed to. Because the good thing about this is that once we turn it on, it, it's, it works the same way all the time. So it, it doesn't screw up one order every now and then. It, it's typically something else that's going wrong. And on the world ship, they, uh, uh, there's the two steps. There's a um, keyed import map. There's a little yellow thing that... Um, they go into world ship and they say, um, I want to use the import map, and it just pops up a little box that lets them type in the order number. And then there's the piece they, that we set in world ship that says, after you process shipment, automatically export. And the key to that is that, um, of course, just because we turn on the integration to import data from the automate, you can still manually ship anything in the world you want to. You just fill out the UPS screen manually. But of course, if you didn't type in the e automate sales order number, it, it won't know what to go update in the automate, so um, it will try to go update the automate, but it'll throw up a little error to the UPS world ship going, uh, I, I, ODBC error, basically saying, I couldn't find the sales order. And um, so what we do is we just tell the warehouse guys, because what we found is they could turn that off. They could go in and say, don't export. Let me ship the owner's golf clubs to San Diego for his meeting, and then let me go turn it back on again they inevitably forget to turn it back on. Uh -huh. and, and then they ship for two or three days, and then you guys are calling me going, well, something's broken, it's not updating all the shipments, and then you go look and like, oh yeah, we forgot to turn that back on. So I found it easier just to, because uh, warehouse guys are pretty good at doing the same thing over and over again, and they're pretty good of, of, um, of exceptions. That's why they're in the warehouse. 
Um, as I tell them, look, if you type in a sales order number, you should never get an error message. If you didn't type in a sales order number, you're going to get an error message. Just ignore it. And they're, they're typically okay with that. So. And when you update the world shift, like, by year, so it mm -hmm. automatically updates. Your software would, like, yeah, and that's the cool thing about it. unless WorldShip does something to you know, like same thing with the automate. Unless they completely change what they do on the backside, it, the my integration is pretty innocuous. I'm pulling the data from their tables that are pretty standard. So unless they change their whole world and redo their entire table, change the way their database is stored, uh, then it, it's you know, knock on wood. It's it's not it doesn't affect our integration at all. Now the mapping, the weird thing about the mapping that we do because of the way WorldShip works is it's, lo it's tied to the user logged in. So you have, I don't, I don't know if you have um, uh, how your warehouse guys log in, but if, if I set up the mapping for, for, for Robert, and Robert logs into, World, and World logs into that PC every morning, and then Robert's out for a week, and then John starts to log in, all the mapping's gone. It only works for Robert. So typically what we do is we tell everybody, look, just set up a, uh, a Windows user called Shipping, and that way it's there, and, and just tell all your warehouse guys to always log in to, to Windows as Shipping, and then that way your, your, your mapping stays. Well, I don't know why UPS locked all the uh, profile to the user's profile, but it's, it's insane, but that's what they did. We just have a typical one user login back here called Shipping. Yeah, you go. Perfect. That's what we used to. So that way it doesn't matter. When we map it for that shipping user, the only time we ever have to do all the remapping, and that takes about an hour, is if um, that computer crashes or you uninstall and reinstall WorldShip. And, and unfortunately, there's no, there's no uh, dang um, configuration file that I could send. If it did, I would charge $200 less and just send everybody the files and say, here you go, rock and roll, just copy this to UPS, and boom, all your mapping's done. They don't have that. FedEx has it, but UPS doesn't. So okay. it's, it's a manual, I have to manually log in and go through the physical steps of mapping the import and map the export. And, um, and like I said, that's, that takes about 30 or 45 minutes. And then the rest of the time it just takes us for, to test it. We want, we want to make sure everything works. Okay. Uh, back to the rules. Mm -hmm. We have two separate rules, is that correct? And one of them will be our maximum before freight or the minimum, whatever you want to call it, before freight is charged. And the right. other one would be which customers we want to exclude. Right, and we'll do a custom property. We suggest you set up a custom property in the automate and assign that attribute to the customer. Okay. Anything else that we should consider having as a rule? No, if you, if you, no that's typically that's pretty much everybody has done has been uh, it's either turn off this customer where no you know no freight supplied or uh, set by a dollar amount. Okay. You know, in other words, the other thing too is that if, if a lot of people say instead of doing all the different contract things, they're basically saying if I'm not if I'm not charging for supplies, then there's no charge for freight. Um, um, but then the other, but then more, but in the past couple of years, well, the gas prices, we've a lot of us have found it better to get a flat shipping rate. So some people say just charge on a flat rate, charge fourteen ninety five for every shipment. You know, uh, unless unless it's more than four hundred dollars, then it's free. Um, okay. So, but all those things are just, but just if we get past two rules, it just gets to be too complex. Um, so if we can do two rules, just a custom property. You know, you set up the attribute and you assign it to a customer, and then I just look at the sales order and I look, I take the customer of the sales order and go look and see, did you disable his custom property? And um, um, and then if that's if that's not disabled, well, what's the order sales order amount, and is it less than, you know, is it greater than X? And if it's greater than X, don't charge freight because most people are like if it's if they're free shipping for everything over four hundred bucks or everything over one hundred dollars. It may be the opposite for you, but okay. Is the markup? Rule as well, or is that something kind of? Included? No, that's easy. Yeah, that's yeah. That yeah. All I'm all, all I'm doing with the custom property and the dollar amount is: do I apply the freight cost times 1.2 or not, or do I just push zero as the as the freight charge? That that shipment cost. I always push the cost back into e-automate, but that doesn't affect anything. It makes no general ledger transaction. This right here. 
That's what your UPS cost is. That never hits the automates accounting, never hits the invoice, it never shows up anywhere except on this shipment. Cool. So I always push that back. This is where I just look to see, eh, was it more than 400 bucks or did you disable it? And if not, then 1.2 times 7 you know, cool. is, is what the integration does. So and then the agent takes care of it, and so that's the beauty. It's, and then if you're using the, uh, the UPS uh, uh, email piece, um, it's pretty much hands off at that point. I don't think I have any more questions either. I think you've answered it pretty thoroughly for us. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. It's like I said, it's pretty straight up, and then some, you know. We rock and roll, and we can do the. We can schedule the uh, the install like one day. Typically, I, you guys are Central Time, so you know, like after UPS picks up for the afternoon is probably usually a good time for most guys like you. It's like, hey, three thirty, UPS has already picked us up, so you're not killing us if you, you know, if you t if you have the machine for an hour and a half. Okay, yeah, that's that's not a big deal. We're not a huge dealer, so it's not like we have hundreds of shipments going out every day. Yeah, and it's pretty. 